A few seats down here still. Morning, everybody. Welcome to our first plenary session of SEH Congress 2023. I've been asked to tell everybody that this session is being live streamed both to the other room, but also publicly as well. So uh, language, etc., needs to be moderated. <laughs> I'm sure everybody here is very polite. So um, uh, hopefully those of you that were here last night enjoyed the icebreaker. I know I did, uh, but I will repeat the welcome on behalf of all the local organizing committee and SEH to the 22nd. Uh, European Congress of Herpetology. I also need, because although I don't live in Wolverhampton, I also need, because nobody did, to welcome you as a local. So I will say, all right, everybody, <laughs> we hope you're having a Boston time. Now, I did that for two reasons. I don't live very far away, as you probably realise. Um, I want to introduce you to a new word, which is Boston. If you're in a pub or a restaurant and somebody says, are you enjoying your meal, ladies and gentlemen? You can say, yes, it's Boston. And that means, of course, it's really good, excellent, superb. Uh, and the nice segue there is that somebody who's had a Boston impact on herpetology in the UK and elsewhere in Europe is Professor Richard Griffiths. There you go, you see. Did you see how I did that? <laughs> um, Emeritus Professor of Conservation Biology at the University of Kent, uh, Trustee of Amphibian Conservation, uh, Amphibian Reptile Conservation, but uh, that's only the organisation I work for, <laughs> um, uh, and also known widely for a, a variety of research over decades from conservation of axolotls in Central America to slow worms in Kent and everything in between. He also has the dubious honour of being my former PhD supervisor, so he's got a lot to answer for. <laughs> uh, but with that, I will leave it to Richard, and uh, we will get on, I think. But Richard. Thank you, John, for those very generous words. Uh, I think, John, as John has alluded to, um, I've got to that stage in life where I'm sort of drifting with as much dignity as I can into the realms of herpetological old fartdom. <laughs> and uh, it's always very nice to be invited to do a talk like this because you do get to a stage in life where you, you wonder whether you've got anything that's worth saying any, any again. Um, I, mean, I did do a talk, the last time I got an invitation was just over a year ago to a conference where I, I didn't know very much about the, the organisers. And when I got the program through, I was rather concerned that they thought they'd booked an exhumed corpse <laughs> that sadly died rather young in the 14th century. Um, but I can assure you that I'm not yet a member of the Walking Dead. Um, I shall hopefully last till the end of this presentation and perhaps a little bit longer. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, a few things. This is going to be very much a personal perspective. I'd like to, to just go over a little bit about progress in herbs, logical reintroductions, how science and practice uh, mesh or don't mesh with each other. How does amphibian and reptile reintroductions fit in with the rewilding agenda? 
how do they fit in with ecosystems and ecosystem services. I'm going to finish off with a, a little bit of a case study from uh, a more recent project I've been involved with in Bermuda. The evolution of science and guidance. Now, one of the last things is that um, the IUCN who produced uh, a series of booklets and guidance over the years. And I think if we look at how this has actually evolved, I mean, back in 1987, there was this sort of typewritten concept note about reintroductions and restocking. And then this was consolidated in 1998 into a, a little bit more guidance, and then this was updated in 2013. And then more recently, we've got more specific guidance for different taxa, including a document specifically for amphibians. On top of this, we've got regional documents. There's a guidance for UK reintrodu in, reintroductions in the UK. If you look at these, uh, what you'll see is that they become more voluminous over time, with the possible exception of the one in 1998, although I should say that was actually longer than the 1987 document, because the typescript was a lot smaller. But the documents have got longer and longer, and I think this reflects the amount of information and knowledge that has to be incorporated uh, as, as we've progressed. And I think probably up to about 2013, most of the guidance was is very much based on mammal and bird reintroductions and provided a framework. And I think this precipitated the need for a specific guidance on amphibians because there were some things about amphibians that were, that were quite different from mammals and birds. On top of that, there's a lot of stuff in the literature, including this excellent edited book, the definitive book on reintroduction biology. So what has changed over time? Well, to my mind, we've actually obviously had a lot more science to inform the sorts of decisions that we make. And I think what we've seen is, a, is an increase in emphasis on feasibility of the project and the design of the project. There's also a much greater emphasis on risk. And risk can happen at all sorts of levels within a reintroduction program. There can be risks to the donor site, risk, risks to the recipient site, risks to other species, risks to the people involved with the reintroduction. So that's become fairly integral. Also, there's increased consideration of what we sometimes call surrogate species or ecological replacement species. If you go back to the 1980s, really the idea of putting a species that hadn't naturally occurred there was a complete no-no. Uh, and now we realise that if you take a more ecosystem level type of approach, then in some places that species is gone. And so uh, with careful consideration, there may be the possibility that you could put another species in there that fills that ecological role. And likewise, what has also changed is, again, back in the 80s, the idea of, of reintroducing something outside what was supposedly the natural range was probably a no-no. Now we're embracing assisted colonisation. We have to, simply because the habitats aren't necessarily available with the existing range, and we've got to take account of things like climate change. Now, the AUCN produced these very nice books of case studies, the Global Reintroduction Perspectives. I think there's about six volumes of them where people document case studies on particular species, and they're asked to score them on the level of success. And uh, PhD student Gemma Harding and I have played around with these figures, and we produced this summary graph here of, of sort of where they lie. So um, I think the thing is with these sorts of figures, is that you can really spin them whichever way you want. And I think the sort of more optimistic people would look at that and say, well, things are looking pretty good, really. There's quite a few highly successful projects. There's quite a few successful projects. And if you compare these to some earlier analyses, there certainly seems to be an increase in success level. If you take a more pessimistic view of this, you can say, well, wait a minute. This is, these have been fairly arbitrarily scored by the people doing the projects anyway. There's probably a hideous bias in here anyway, because people are only going to write up projects that are likely to be successful. So if, if they fail, they're not likely to be successful. And also, these figures aren't really that good anyway. If there's been sort of 30, 40 years of developing the science, why isn't there higher levels of success? Really, you know, it's, it's not great in terms of the amount of time we've had to do these. So as I say, I think you can read into these whichever way you like. Um, there are some highly successful projects, and here's a few that I think are sort of fairly well known. The other thing we try to do is to play around and identify well, what are the drivers, what are the key ingredients of a successful project? And we've played around with different 
levels of success and different types of drivers. And it's actually very difficult to build a reliable statistical model that does that. What I would say that comes out quite clearly is that if you want a higher level of success, you have to be in it for the long term. And if you're in it for less than 10 years, it's probably unlikely you're going to get up to that level. And a lot of these projects, most of these projects here are probably 20 years, 30 years or more. So it does require a long-term commitment, and there's going to be ups and downs along that journey. Some of the early pod in the early stages can be up and down, and it sometimes takes quite a few generations of the species that you're looking at to get up to that sort of level. So we have all this guidance, and most of us here are scientists. Now, the thing is in the introduction is that us scientists are vastly outnumbered by the number of people out there doing it in practice. There's loads of NGOs, there's loads of organisations, there's loads of individuals who are doing it. So when our reintroduction scientist here goes along and talks to some of the practitioners about the things they need to think about, what are those sorts of things? Well, is it evidence-based? There, is there a good case based on science to support those actions? Is there a strategic plan with timeframes and milestones, etc.? Is there a risk analysis? Are you following established protocols? Have you done any modeling of all the potential scenarios? And is your monitoring protocol in place? And is it going to be robust? Now, in my experience, when you go along and you talk to practitioners about all these things that they should be doing, you get a very wide range of reactions. And I'm going to sort of slightly caricature the range of reactions that we get. First of all, you can get quite a positive reaction. They say, wow, this all sounds good. Yep, I'm going to take all of those on board and make sure we cover them. You can then get one that's a little bit more sceptical, and they go, really, this all sounds rather complicated and interesting. Um, yeah, I suppose you should be doing it, but I'm probably too busy. I can forget about it afterwards anyway. And then you have those that are actually openly hostile to it. And those that say, we don't need to do all this stuff. We're in a crisis. We're in a biodiversity and climate crisis. We need to get on with it. We haven't got time to do all of this interesting academic research. And I think this is an interesting issue because it is driving what we sometimes refer to as maverick rewilding. Now, rewilding has been around for you know some time. And back in 2009, Tim Carrow here, who is a you know one of the world's leading mammal ecologists, was issuing some warnings about it that we need to be careful about doing it. And that was in 2009. But it hasn't stopped the rise of maverick rewilding. And these are people who are highly motivated, want to go out there, want to do something very, very quick. And it's happening with butterflies and some other groups as well. We have issues with, but we know that some butterfly species in Britain are recovering of their own accord, but equally there are people going out and breeding them and sort of go out the back pocket into the wild. It means you don't know whether they've got there on their own or whether somebody's actually tipped them out of the plastic box. So this is an ongoing issue about uh, how we actually address this. What, why, is, why is this coming about? Well, if anyone's read Isabella True's wonderful book about the story of NEP, and I should emphasize here, I don't regard NEP as a maverick rewilding project. I think it's a fantastic flagship project that is really leading the way. But this is a really interesting book about the history. And one of the things about NEP is that there were no goals. It was basically taking a chunk of farmland and saying we're going to stop farming and we're going to put it back to nature and we're going to see what happens. And if you think about how conservation science has developed, we've, we've adopted the strategy from business and commerce. We have things that have activities, outputs, outcomes, impact and measurable indicators. I think NEP really sort of flew in the face of that idea. And it was just saying, we're going to rewild, we don't have any goals, we're going to see what happens. And I think this has been grist to the mill for a lot of maverick rewilders. They said, we don't really need to bother with all this science and this goals and everything. Let's just get on with it. The other thing that I think is driving it is that due to the rise of populism, um, there's been more scepticism of science than there has been for a long time. 
And I think within certain sectors of populism, scientists are also almost put in the same, uh, the same categories as bankers, estate agents, and, and car dealers, not necessarily to be trusted. And I think this is an issue as well. This is one of my favorite quotes in conservation. It's an old one by Earl McCoy, you know, done back in 1994, in the early days of amphibian decline research. And it's really saying, should we be conservationist huts and master our expertise in defense of life, or should we be scientists and look at truth? And I think this is where, as scientists, what we're doing with our research is we must be on a long train journey. We're going along this long train journey and we're doing more and more research at the different stations. But at some stage, we've got to get off that train and make a decision that we're going to start doing conservation action in the wild. And it's a really tricky one about where you stop doing research and you start doing implementing conservation. Because if, if you implement conservation that is not informed by evidence, you'll make some very expensive mistakes. And if you spend your life doing research and saying, I'm not going to do anything until I have all the data, then effectively the species is likely to be gone, and you may well have researched it into extinction. So it's a real dilemma that I think we all face. How can we reconcile some of these things? How do, who influences what happens in reintroductions? Well, here's our government environmental regulator. I should emphasize that any similarity between that person sitting at that desk and anyone living or dead or in this room for that matter is purely coincidental. <laughs> um, not all the introductions are regulated by the government, but a lot of them are. Who are the people and organizations influencing this chat? Well, we've got the politicians and the lawyers, first of all. The politicians make the law, the lawyers meant to implement. You should say, well, aren't they one and the same? It would be very naive of me to suggest that politicians were law abiding. <laughs> but in addition to that, we've got the scientists who broadly fall into ecologist geneticists, vets, there's probably other types of scientists and some types of of reintroduction programs. It'd be nice to think that scientists all uh, sing from the same hymn sheet, but they don't. Um, not only do the scientists in these different categories not always agree with each other, but even within those categories, they won't always agree with each other. And over here, we've got the ecological consultants who will be implementing that. We've got the people who are funding it, the NGOs who will want to say, and often NGOs don't agree with each other because they've got different agendas and we've got the general public. So this government environmental regulator sitting here is getting lots of stuff in his ears from all of these people. Now, in an ideal world, how would this all work out? Well, you get all these people around the table, you'd make a, make a nice actual plan, you'd allocate who's doing what, time frames, budgets, outcomes, measurable indicators. I always say producing an action plan is really quite easy. The really hard bit is making it work. Because the reality is that even if you have a nice plan like this, there's two things that drive the direction that it's going to go in. One, who's putting up the cash, and two, who's shouting the loudest. And this can mean that it can go off in any one or other of these directions, depending on who's putting up the money and who's actually saying what. Where does herpetological reintroductions fit into rewilding then? Well, when rewilding sort of kicked off, probably in, I think it was in the 90s, but it really sort of started to gain traction probably in the last 10 to 15 years or so. I, I was looking at it, I think, well, I don't think there's anything new here. It's really doing lots of things that we're already doing, reintroductions, ecosystem services, livelihoods, all of these things are not new. They're all things that we've been doing a long time. And what rewilding did was really put these under one umbrella. So I view rewilding as something that is just really collating a lot of things that were already happening into sort of one package. I'm not going to get into the definition of rewilding because um, I could spend an hour discussing that. There's a lot of disagreement over that. But I would say that a lot of people don't like the term rewilding because it implies that you're trying to create something that's happened in the past, whereas we should be looking forward. So a lot of organizations prefer the use wilding. So where do reintroductions and translocations sit in? So what we've actually seen is that 
reintroductions and translocations have been going on for many, many decades, and they're now starting to embrace some of these other things that are coming under the rewilding umbrella. How do they fit in with ecosystem services, habitat management, restoration, and so on? Okay, now I think most people in this room have had moments like this young lady sitting at her desk, staring out of the window, thinking foggy thoughts or snaky thoughts, and trying to come up with what do you write in that introductory paragraph to your essay or your thesis or your latest paper. I do it all the time. If you look at, look at a lot of papers on um, conservation of amphibians and reptiles, this is quite a frequent statement in those opening paragraphs that they play an important role in ecosystems. Likewise, you quite often read they play an important role in ecosystem services. I'd like to spend a little bit of time just unpacking these statements, which, as I say, are very, very common within the literature. What are ecosystem services? Well, if we use the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, definition, they fall into these four groups. You've got provisioning surfaces, services, which are the things that effectively provide resources and money for humans, so medicines, food, uh, materials. You've got regulating ecosystem services that are related to things like water purity, pollination, etc. You've got the cultural stuff that makes us feel good, walking in the countryside, etc. And you've got the supporting services, which really sort of provide an overarching framework for all these others. Well, let me just digress for a minute. Um, you, you probably realise that um, I spent my angst-ridden teenage years in the 1970s. And a major influence on my personal and cultural development at that time was Monty Python's Flying Circus. And one of my favourite characters in Monty Python's Flying Circus is this character here, who goes by the name of Reg. Now, Reg is somebody that I think we've all met in our all walks of life, because Reg is someone who is unconvinced by logical argument. And if we went to Reg and said to Reg, well, what do you think about the benefits of nature? He would say, what has nature ever done for us? You can come back to Reg with some perfectly logical, rational, evidence-based answers, such as pollinates our crops, gives us clean water, mitigates climate change, etc. What will Reg say? <laughs> <laughs> Apart from all those things, what has nature ever done for us? I apologise to anyone who hasn't seen Monty Python's Life of Brian because you're wondering what on earth I'm banging on about. But it's one of my favourite movies. I've watched it time and time again and it still makes me laugh. So I think what, what I'm getting at here is that we need pretty compelling arguments because there's lots of people like Reg out there in all walks of life that are just not going to accept it. So let's have a closer look at our theory of reptile roles in ecosystem services. There's not a great literature out there, actually. There's a few papers. There's this one which was published in Herb Conservation and Biology by Hocking and Babbitt. There's one that relates to the neotropics, which is worth looking at. And there's another one, there's a contract that Art Trust did for the Welsh Government, which, like a lot of government reports, is buried in some dark and dim dungeon of their website and that is hard to unearth, but here's the link. And um, this is a very good one because it, it goes beyond great trusted news. It actually highlights a lot of the wider issues of ecosystem services. If we look at what these are saying and um, what they're not saying as well, um, what about provisioning services for amphibians and reptiles? Well, to my mind, there's no doubt that amphibians and reptiles will can contribute to provisioning service in terms of food, in terms of goods, in terms of medicines. And I think there's enormous potential at the moment with all the work that's been going on amphibian disease, on antimicrobial peptides, possibly opiate substitutes, all these sorts of things. All of these are provisioning services. However, I do struggle with these arguments a little bit because all of these things that we use these species for are also creating enormous problems. We know that trade 
and the collection of species in the wild in many parts of the world is an enormous threat. Xenopus toads, probably the most widely used amphibian for biomedical purposes, being spread around the world. It's probably spread chytrid around the world as well. So I do feel very uneasy about trying to stress the importance of amphibians and reptiles in provisioning services, because it's almost really propagating a lot of the problems that they're actually going to be facing. What about regulating services? Well, we know that amphibians, tadpoles, and some adult salamanders will regulate things like mosquito larvae. They will reduce the densities of those. We know that tadpoles will affect the algae in the pond. We know that frogs and other species will eat agricultural pests. And these are often used as arguments for regulating services. To my mind, what is missing here is the link has not been made to improved agriculture, and the link has not been made to improved yields or reduced diseases. Um, whenever I'm talking to people about in fact, to put a garden in their pond, one thing is they often say, well, if they're to give me a load of mosquitoes. And so we try and argue, well, yes, but if you had a real balanced pond, then it'll all be controlled. There's, there's actually, I, I, if anyone has any evidence that, there, that this link has been made, I mean, it's an extraordinarily difficult link to make, because it's a very, from a research point of view, then I, I, I'd like to hear about it. But I do struggle with that one as well. Cultural ecosystem services, I think these are really underplayed. Because I think amphibians and reptiles, historically, artistically, in literature, have played major roles in our culture over the decades, over the, over the centuries in many words. I don't think we pay so much attention to these, because as scientists, we like things that we can quantify, that we can put numbers on, and, and you can possibly do this with provisional and regulating services. Much harder, much more ethereal to do this with the cultural ecosystem services. So I think we underplay this. A project that I've never persuaded any students to take up uh, is to go into a gift shop and look at all the gift cards and count the numbers that have animals on them. My hypothesis is that after dogs and cats, frogs would be pretty high up there. So there's a dissertation project if anyone would like to give it a go. Very easy. <laughs> And then we've got supporting services. I mean, again, I think amphibians and reptiles undoubtedly play roles within these cycles, whether they play overarching roles that are going to lead to something that you can actually point at and say that is resulting in human benefit by providing ecosystem service, I think is very challenging. What about the other taxa? Well, other taxa, beavers, there's no doubt. They are ecosystem engineers. They provide ecosystem services. They will result in ponds. They can clean water and things like that. Bison, I've been peripherally involved with the bison project in Kent. Contrary to what you might hear, we haven't got sort of bison wandering alongside the M25 uh, all over the place. They're actually in a very large enclosure where they're being used to manage the woodland. And there's no doubt that they will have an impact on the woodland. We're not entirely sure what sort of impact it's going to have. That's what's being measured at the moment. But bison, uh, you know, they, they're going to have an impact. Pollinators, you know, there is an insect apocalypse that is, that is likely to affect food security. There's a, there's a link that can be made directly to humans. And then birds of prey. Sea eagle tourism in Scotland, it's worth millions. There's, I don't know if anyone has read George Membio's book, Feral. He points out that if you look at Wales, the amount of income that comes into Wales through motor tourism and outdoor activities is four times the income they get from sheep farming. And sheep farming, if you go to Wales, the first thing you can see across the border is the sheep uh, because they are all over, I think it's probably 70% of the landscape has got sheep on so these are all things that you can make direct links to ecosystem services with. So to my mind, what we need to do with amphibian and reptiles is to try and be much bolder about getting involved with these other projects, make them part of a bigger thing, rather than trying to argue the case for them individually. And again, there's some nice projects that's already happening. Here's a good one happening down in Dorset that involves seven NGOs coming together to create a super nature reserve joining up a lot of the heathland areas there. 
So this is the sort of project that I think where amphibians and reptiles can be embraced within bigger projects, and it's the, the projects that you can actually point to that provide the ecosystem services. That said, I think there are some challenges in terms of habitat uh, management and restoration with amphibians and reptiles. Here's a lovely bit of heathland with reptiles on it. As you can see, there's not many trees. Now, one of the other things that is you know, fundamental to the rewilding agenda is reforestation and carbon sequestration. So herpetologists, do they do reforestation? No, they tend not to. They tend to do the opposite. I put my hands up. This is a milk pile that I created. Well, I tell a lie. I didn't actually do the creation because the logs were a bit too heavy for me. But these, these rather fitter, younger students and volunteers did the lifting, and I did quite a lot of pointing. <laughs> but we were quite proud of that log pile. And every year, this is at a site that we've been monitoring for about 25 years. I have discussions with Forestry England, who manage the site, so can you take a few more trees down, please? What about ponds? You often see stuff on websites and NGOs about wetlands being good for carbon sequestration. Is that true? Well, there's a bit of evidence that's starting to emerge that suggests it's a little bit questionable. It's complicated, and I'm not a geochemist, but it depends a lot on things like sediment flows and rainfall and things like this. Uh, but certainly ponds will, will absorb carbon dioxide and methane, but they also can release it as well. And this paper, which was published uh, in 2016, looked at small ponds, and they worked out that if you look at the surface area of lakes and ponds globally, small ponds comprise about 8.6% of the surface area of lakes and ponds globally. In terms of carbon, they account for 15% of carbon dioxide emissions and 41% of methane emissions within that category. Probably a drop in the ocean when you look at sort of carbon flux globally, but it does make you think, mm, maybe ponds are not the sort of things that we think are sucking carbon out of the sky as well. And this isn't just a wild card exercise. There's a more recent paper published by the Swedish group in conjunction with CH that came up with some fairly similar conclusions and actually said that probably newly created ponds in particular are emitters of methane and carbon dioxide. So we need to tread a little bit carefully when we're trying to make these arguments about everything is good for everything that's happening under the rewilding agenda. So going back to our young lady who's pondering how to write this introductory paragraph, amphibians and reptiles play important roles in ecosystems. Is that true? But it's probably, it is true. I'm not sure it's helpful. I think we can argue that pretty much everything plays a role in the ecosystem. A house fire plays a role in an ecosystem. A brown rat plays a role in an ecosystem. So I'm not really sure that's terribly helpful, even though it's true. Amphibians and reptiles play important roles in ecosystem services. I'm a little bit unsure about that one. I think it, without contextualizing that statement, I think that is a slightly trickier statement to actually write in your essay. So I think the moral of this is that if you're writing a paper and you want to put that in there, don't suggest me as a referee. <laughs> <laughs> Interim conclusions. There are tensions between science and practice. We've always heard about the science-practice divide. I, I, I think with rewilding, it's probably a little bit worse than it is more generally. Plans may not go according to plan. And, you know, you say, well, a good plan will have adaptive management built into it to take account of changes as you go along. Um, but it does make you wonder, well, if the plan is going to change all the time, uh, do we really need to spend all this time at the beginning trying to produce this round table, big document that sort of has a big table at the end with a log frame and who's doing what and what the outputs are and everything else? I think it is challenging to justify reptiles and amphibians as providers of some ecosystem services. And I think we have to tread carefully when it comes to habitat restoration and management. They may not sit comfortably within the wider climate change mitigation agendas. 
So if I've made you feel like this <laughs> up to this point in time, don't worry, there's some good news coming shortly. But not before I've given you some more bad news. <laughs> I'd like to take you to Bermuda. Interesting place. Uh, been working there for about 12 years on and off. And there's some very interesting historical things going on in Bermuda. Bermuda's not very big, as you can see. Uh, it consists of about 150, 190 islands. I'm not sure everyone's counted them. Uh, you can see this is the airport here. You can see how big it is by the length of the, the runway. And effectively, these it, it, Bermuda is like two massive subterranean volcanoes with their craters sort of poking above the surface on which has been deposited a lot of limestone. So th these are sort of remnant volcanic caldeiras that have blasted out the ocean about 33 million years ago. And the other thing you can see from this is that it's pretty much developed pretty much everywhere. There's not much on Bermuda that hasn't got a golf course on it or that hasn't got a big house. Um, I have to say that, you know, after doing sort of three or four decades of doing ungodly hours under cold, wet conditions, under rainy nights around ponds, the opportunity to go to Bermuda to do some field work did actually seem quite appealing at my stage of life. And the reason I went there was to look at this species, the Bermuda skink, which is not only the only endemic reptile in Bermuda, it's the only endemic terrestrial vertebrate on Bermuda. So there's a diamond bacteria as well, which I shall mention, but that's sort of semi-aquatic, so it doesn't really count. But this species is of tremendous importance. And the history of the Bermuda skin, we've been pretty knackered by all the development on Bermuda. It's been pretty much wiped out. Uh, it's, it's occurring at a few places in the mainland. But it does mean that um, Things like cats and rats have been a major predator. Uh, and it does mean that these little offshore islands are the places where it's going to have these strongholds. And these are known, what is known as the Castle Island uh, Islands. And there's one particular island here that I think has a really interesting story in the history of rewilding. It's totally protected. No one's allowed on it without a permit. And this is the island here. And you see it's not very big at all. You can see it's got a couple of cottages on there, which is where we stay. And you can walk from one side to the other in about 20 minutes. And one such island has a really interesting history, and I'm putting this in a historical time frame. Because back in 1965, uh, this chap, David Wingate, was appointed as the warden. And David Wingate, to my mind, was a rewilder before his time. He was doing rewilding on one such island before the term existed. He didn't call it rewilding, he called it the Living Museum Project. And what he wanted to do, seeing that Bermuda was the mainland part, was pretty much knackered, he said, I want to really convert one such island into an environment where we do restoration and reintroductions and have it as an example of what Bermuda would have been like probably in pre-settlement times. The problem was that in the 60s, when, he's, when he took over on such island, uh, it was pretty much grazed to buggery by goats, and there were rats all over it, very little vegetation. So the first thing that he did was to eliminate those. The other thing which has an integral part of this story is that one of the main reasons for doing this was this bird, the Bermuda petrel or the cahal. And this was, was thought to be extinct for 300 years. It was thought to be wiped out by the early settlers uh, in the 1500s, 1600s. And it was re a few pairs were rediscovered on some of these outlying islands. And no such island was seen as you know, a place where this species could recover. And this has a, an integral part in the skink stories we shall see in a minute. The other problem was with having got rid of the goats and the cats, we now did to, need, needed a reforestation program. Now the logical plant to use here was the endemic Bermuda cedar. And the problem here was that a rich American gentleman back in the 1940s who liked junipers, brought a load of junipers to Bermuda, and in doing so, introduced a scale insect. And those scale insects pretty much wiped out the native Bermuda cedars by over 90%. So they were, they were pretty much 
not completely gone. There were some that were kept in nurseries and things like that, but it wasn't possible to use these for restoration. So instead, David Wingate and his colleagues did a bit of research and they identified some surrogate species that could be placed, that they could use to plant in place of the native Bermuda cedars, so Australian pine and various others. And in order to encourage the establishment of these, they used a pumice fertilizer. So the trees need to be quite wind resistant, need to be quite salt resistant as well. And this was going on in the mainland as well. The pumice fertilizer had an unforeseen outcome because it, the lion crabs used this as it was a very tasty snack. And they consumed a lot of the pumice fertilizer, had a population explosion, and caused barrows and soil erosion. And it's really annoyed the golfers on the mainland of Bermuda, I can tell you. You don't want to upset golfers. So this was a little bit of an issue. And David Winnebeck did a little bit of research, and he worked out that historically there was a there was a, a heron. The, there was a, the yellow crown night heron was actually used to be found on uh, in Bermuda, and it went extinct. And the thing about the yellow crown night heron is that it's a crab specialist. So there was some research that was done. That thought, well, let's put back this crab specialist eating heron to control the crabs. So 44 yellow crown night herons were introduced. Uh, a little bit later on, with more research, it was actually, and David Wingate himself took a closer look at the, the bones from the new, and in fact it was found, well, it probably wasn't the true yellow crown night heron that went extinct, it was one that was very, very similar. And then more recent research found that these night herons that were introduced weren't the crab specialists that they thought they were. <laughs> and on the mainland, they started to eat the hatchling diamond back terrapins from one of the last remaining diamond back terrapin sites. So I suppose a baby terrapin does look rather like a crab. So they started to hit those, and there was also a suspicion that they were taking amphibians and reptiles as well, possibly having an impact on the Bermuda skeet. So here was an introduction made with the best evidence at the time, but later research said, well, actually, that probably wasn't a very good idea. So that was in the 70s. 70s, early 80s. Let's go back to 1905. Jamaican islands were released because there was a fruit fly problem in Bermuda. And it was thought that these could actually help control the fruit flies. They spread right across Bermuda. I think people thought they were very nice as well. I mean, anoles are. I mean, they're very, you know, they're very uh, characteristic. And, you know, that jump, they're sort of like monkey lizards jumping around with displaying their flaps and everything, they've got big personalities. So I think a lot of people all have some of those in my garden. So it became widespread across Bermuda, and it was found that they weren't just, they really didn't control the fruit, fruit flies, but they started to eat the beneficial insects, including the parasites of the scale insect that had been introduced accidentally, that was killing off the, the, the Bermuda cedars. So they were a problem as well. So, and this is before, <laughs> this is before David Wingate's time, they think, well, let's introduce great kiskadees from Trinidad to control the animals that are eating the beneficial insects and the parasites and scale insects that are killing off the Bermuda cedars. Of course, what did the kiskadees eat? The Bermuda skinks, the endemic Bermuda land snails, and indeed the endemic Bermuda cicada, which subsequently went extinct, probably due to the Kiskadees. So another case of, at the time it seemed like a good idea, but turned out to be a bit disastrous. Another facet to the story, David Wingate put two ponds in on one such island, and there's very little fresh water on Bermuda, there's no rivers, there's a few sort of semi-brackish pools, but he wanted to help recover this species, the Bermuda killifish, another endemic two species on Bermuda. And he thought putting two ponds in here on them such, we could reintroduce them. Two very nice ponds were created. What did they attract? Cane toads. 
Pantotes colonised the ponds. In one report, David Wingate was out on his boat and he actually saw a pantote swimming through the sea towards another such island. <laughs> so those impact the skinks as well. So these ponds are still there, but there's now a damn great fence out around them, trying to keep the blooming cane toads out. So, what does this boil down to? Well, the Bermuda skink has almost a perfect storm of threats to it. And a lot of these stem from sort of very early on development-related threats. And a lot of them stem from what was at the time thought to be a very sound way of controlling other problems, but subsequently turned out to be rather disastrous. Is there any good news? There is some good news. Let me take you back to the Bermuda Petrol or the Cajal. One of the things that was done with the Cajals was that they, they were having bad no nesting sites. They were being wiped out by hurricanes and the cliff falls and things like that. So this artificial nest site, were, these artificial nest sites were developed. You've got a little tunnel and then a nest chamber at the end. And these were built and they were put all around the island. And these were very, very successful. And they weren't only used by the cahals, they were also used by the skinks. Skinks loved them. And in fact, to do a bit of research on what was going on to monitor the nestling, some cameras were actually put in to the lids. And so you have this webcam looking at what's going on in the cahals nest. And not only were the skinks using them, but they discovered that there is a sort of mutualistic relationship. This large, large grey blob in the middle is actually a cahal chick. It's a big thing. And the skinks will actually go in and they will eat the feces, remove the eggshells, remove parasites from the nests. So there's an agreement between the cahals and the skinks. So the skinks act as like the daily house cleavers that come in and clear up. And they get a better bit of protection as well. And Jerry Medeiros, the current warden, he, 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 this data that's still being collected believes that there is, where there are cahals, you tend to get more skinks, and you get higher survival cahals uh, if there are skinks cleaning the nest and vice versa. This has received quite a lot of interesting publicity, so it's been in the news, and in fact there is a live webcam, Cahal Cam, where you can go on and you can sort of look in a cahal's nest and see if there's any skinks running around those. So it's a quite a big PR thing in Bermuda as well. This is again important for the sort of more cultural ecosystem service uh, type of arrangements. There's a little bit more good news. What about the skink on other islands? On, on one such, there's a skink population that's probably stable. Because the other places you've got all of these threats, it's quite difficult. So really, what you really want is to try and find an island that is, has got no rats and no cats and, and uh, minimised threats, or where you can control them. So this means you need to go for these fairly small islands where you can actually keep on top of the predators. You can't read really anything about the Kiskadees because they're going to fly in. I mean, you can shoot them if you see them, but I mean, they're, they're going to come back again. You can chase away the herons if you've got, you know, you can walk around the island in 10 minutes and chase away the herons again, they probably will come back. So really, there's a, a sweet point between having islands that are small enough to manage, but big enough to support the skink population. And this is another island, it's called Trunk Island, and it's run by the Bermuda Zoological Society. It's very small, smaller than um, Nonsuch Island. You can walk from one side to the other for um, about five minutes. I had my birthday here last year, which was very nice. And Chester Zoo is the only zoo that now is breeding Bermuda skinks. So uh, they have a breeding program, they have an OSH show facility called Skink Pots, and they've been breeding Bermuda skinks uh, with a view to colonising places like Trunk Island. And last year, we went out and did a, an initial release using soft release enclosures like this. Bermuda skinks are the only ones who's worked on skinks. They, they are the scattiest of animals. Uh, they're not on show at, the, at uh, Chester Zoo, because I think if you put them on, a, on display to the public, someone's staring at them, they'd have a collective nervous breakdown. I mean, they, they are, they're, they're, you never see them. So they're really difficult to monitor. But some news that we got just a few weeks ago 
was that a baby skink has been seen on Trunk Island. So it sounds as though the ones that were released only last year uh, may well be breeding. As I mentioned at the beginning, you probably need 10 or 20 years to really follow up. So this is really right at the start. So I think if you invite me back to the 42nd meeting of the SEH, um, <laughs> well, I should know that look more like Mark O'Shea than Mark O'Shea. <laughs> I may be able to produce a more conclusive update on the Bermuda skips. So the positive news. So you can stop crying now. There is some good news here. Reptiles and amphibians are good models for reintroduction projects. I haven't talked much about this because I've somehow like banged on at numerous other presentations. But there's things you can do with reptiles and amphibians that you really can't do with a lot of other species. You can move them around in small boxes. You, you can capitalize on high fecundity in large numbers of tadpoles. You haven't got to worry about amphibians and reptiles and eating sheep or killing your children as they lie in their cots, uh, which is a concern for some other species. So overall, I think they're really good candidates and good models for reintroductions. Uh, they play important roles in cultural ecosystem services. Let's promote that aspect. Let's not be hung up on the commodification of ecosystem services and everything has to have a price on it to, to make it. I don't think the public give a toss about that. I think it's just scientists are hung up on it. I think, the, I think the public really love this idea about cultural ecosystem services more than the other things. They undoubtedly enrich our biodiversity and human well-being. There's no doubt that, particularly if we do it in conjunction with other species and other habitats as well. And failures are important learning exercises. As I say, I think you can look back at Bermuda and say, well, there's a series of disasters there. But those are decisions that were made in good faith at the time. And let's learn from those. We're not very good at that. There's lots of reward and introduction points that let the same mistakes time and time again. But let's learn from these exercises. And the evidence and guidance is improving all the time. And let's capitalise on that uh, and embrace it. So I think my take home message is, um, I think reptiles and amphibians do have a role in, in rewilding programmes. Uh, I think I, I don't agree with maverick type of rewilding. I'm sympathetic to many of the reasons why it goes on, but I think we're not going to learn anything. So we do need to be bold, and I think we do need to be imaginative, uh, but we do need to make sure we don't any, have any more big mistakes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>
Don't, don't, don't do too much talking. Just go out and listen and get a sense of, of all the organisations, all the individuals, and where they are coming from, I think. And I think too many organisations go, right, you know, we're the experts, let's go in here, I'm going to sort this out. And that will always cause problems, I think. I mean, I've, a project, I, another overseas project I was involved with um, that involved a reintroduction, and as tactfully as I could, I said to the government, you know, have you looked at the IUC and guidelines? Because they clearly hadn't. And they, 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 they took umbrage at that. They said, we don't need to look at these guidelines. We have our own national guidelines. So even something as um, you know, tactful as that can put people's backs up. So I think be prepared to do a lot of listing, work out the relationships, and then try and you know, work within the partnership. The other thing I've always found about partnerships is that every conservation project I've been involved with, there's always been a wild card, which is an individual or an organisation that says, I don't agree with what you're doing, I don't like it, I don't go around and do my own thing. And they're not involved at all, and you never really know what they're doing. And it causes, you know, causes a lot of problems for government agencies, not government agencies. Oh, no, we don't know what they're doing either. But, oh. So, I'm not sure if that's answered your question. Any more, sir? Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, what's your, what's your thinking about those species which throughout Europe are not part of any natural ecosystem any longer? I'm thinking more of natural the yellow toads, which produce the most Europe. Mostly are connected with the mining since the original habitats come to Europe. So, would you say they can't be restored? Should we just give up on them? Yeah, you mean the ones that are sort of substituted to, to anthropogenic, you know, they, they rely on anthropogenic disturbance in order to. Yeah, no, I'm like, I, I mean, I. I think we should, we should, I don't think we should ever sort of take anything out of the toolbox and say we're not going to do that. I mean, uh, they may not contribute directly to obviously ecosystem services, but you know, culturally they're important. And you know, we should celebrate, we, we should celebrate these species for what they are, I think. And if you can, you know, I think, I think conserving species and shifting habitats is always going to be difficult because you're always working within, you know, Conservation is well, what is the area within which you're working? And if you're working with like green toads, which are sort of like breed in this mine here, and then when that fills in, they move over there, then it becomes more problematic, I think. So I think there are some difficulties in there, but I wouldn't dismiss them. I think you should try and embrace them. Excellent. I think the idea of celebrating toads is a brilliant place <laughs> to end your plenary. Can we thank Richard once again? Thank you. <laughs>
I think he squeezed, I think he got squeezed on some foot pain in the mouth. Yeah. And obviously, you know, I think he got squeezed on some foot pain in the mouth. Honestly, like, I give you my word, it's like a pain in And then we put it in the. Uh, no, 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 so you're on first. Yeah. Let's check how to pronounce your name so I don't mispronounce it. Okay, it's Mijay. 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 Okay. Try and get it right. Okay. Um, so when you're presenting. So can I ask yeah, yeah, yeah. something for the stream? So that's right. Oh, that's good. Do you want me to move going public? Is it just, just the penny that's going to Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Like, everyone's doing stream, but only in that room up there. Yeah. Fine. So, so it's not. Um, there's a microphone here, just so you get to think if you stand here, people will be able to hear you. Otherwise, there are, if you'd rather walk around, there is two. I think I will stay here because I, I want to use the presenter view. Perfect, yeah, no problem. Um, and then it's being streamed through that camera there, so we'll have a room because this room might be full. And there is a clicker there as well if you need it. Um, I'll be sat just here and I'll hold up. Uh, so, Simon and Scrubbers, just near the end, I'll just say, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions.